In the last couple of videos on the channel, I looked at some games by David Bronstein. And I asked you for your favourite Bronstein games, and I'm grateful for all your suggestions. And here I'd like to feature a game suggested by one of my patrons, Carsten Hansen. I'm very grateful for, to him for drawing my attention to this game. It was played in 1994 when Bronstein was 70 years old, and it's a king's gambit, played in a tournament in Norway, in Gausdal, always had fantastic tournaments in Gausdal. It's a place up in the mountains where you could go skiing. Wonderful. I'm not sure Bronstein was a skier. I used to enjoy the skiing there anyway. So his opponent is Kim Ostrup, who, well, let's just say he's not quite in Bronstein's league. But, well, he was up for a challenge. It's a king's gambit. Bronstein had such a romantic streak to his play. You know, he was an artist. He would play such risky openings, uh, well, just to get an interesting position on the board. And the King's Gambit was, of course, one of his absolute favourite openings. So it's a Kizaritsky. Uh, I prefer to play knight c3 instead of h4. But anyway, it leads to very exciting positions. And Austria plays knight f6. It has an excellent reputation. And here white basically has three moves. You can play d4. You can play bishop c4. Or the move that Bronstein played was knight takes pawn. You might recall the game between Spassky and Fischer that went like this. And, well... I, you can find that video elsewhere on the channel, if not in the in the description. Um, and Spassky won in the end, a very interesting game. In this position, knight c6 is a good move. And that really, I'm afraid, uh, is a problem for white in this variation. Uh, bishop c4, very old move, can be met by d5, and that's also probably okay for black. But we have knight takes g4 from Bronstein here. Knight takes pawn on e4. Now, Bronstein played here knight c3. And apparently he'd waited 50 years to play this move. I'm not sure of the details of the story. That's, that's what I read anyway. The old move here is d3. And actually that's not too bad for white, although... Uh, well, it's terribly complicated, but black should be okay there. It's an old move, and presumably Bronstein was trying to improve on that. Um, I'm not sure knight c3 is much better. <laughs> In fact, it's probably worse. In this position, black played knight g3, which is actually fine. But it seems to me that the most sensible move here is to play pawn to d5 instead, and just to get that centre pawn out and try to claim some space in the centre and get developed. But most players that have arrived at this position are tempted by knight g3. It looks like a, an incredibly strong move. Attacking the rook, perhaps looking to play queen e7 check. I mean, maybe d5 is coming as well. But here, Bronstein played knight d5. Now this is a really remarkable idea that you can get away with a move like this in the opening where white hasn't developed any other pieces <laughs> apart from these knights and suddenly knight f6 check is threatened. Now black plays here I think a good move bishop g7 to cover f6. You can also play bishop e7, bishop d6 probably not as good, but bishop g7 is absolutely fine. And now, of course, if you have to waste time by moving the rook, you can forget it. <laughs> You've got to be consistent here. Once you start playing in this vein, you have to keep going. d4, otherwise black will have time to consolidate, get some pieces out, and then white's position is a bit of a wreck. <laughs> d4. And here black, I think very understandably, just got the king out of the centre. In fact, 
it's possible to take the rook here. You need to be incredibly brave to play like this. And I suspect if you've got nerves of silicon, then you can get away with this. Well, white has a huge initiative here. This is terrifying. But my computer is confident that it can actually defend this position. Okay. I think castles is a very human move and not a bad move at all. So here we go. Got to be consistent. Bishop takes pawn. Threatening the knight. And so the knight is pushed into taking the rook. Now this starts to get very interesting. Knight h6 check. Now if that's taken... Then we've got a check. Well, bishop g7 will allow bishop h6, so king h8. And here, I think white has pretty good compensation for the material. You know, the king could exit to the queen side. All white's pieces are in play. So after knight x6 check, king h8, queen h5. So well, you can see that white's pieces are springy into action. And the king, well, if we can get queenside, that's pretty good. Then the king will be safe. If d6, then, well, the bishop comes into play. f5. Then knight f7. I mean, this looks to me, well, at the very least, let's just say white has tremendous compensation for the material. Black's next move was good. Queen e8 check. Just to disturb the king. But also the queen can be useful on e8. King d2. Good move. King is relatively safe. It would have been nicer to have the king on c1. But in any case, it does clear the, the, the path for the rook to join the attack. Now here, according to my computer... Um, Knight f2 is the best move here, and it thinks the best continuation is this. Rook e1, king d1, and then knight f2, king d2, with a draw by perpetual check. Well, that's kind of ludicrous, really. I mean, white has alternatives to that. Knight takes c7 is possible. Um, I very much doubt whether Bronstein would have headed for a draw in that position. There are, well... Plenty of ways you can risk playing for a win. F5 played by black, and I think that's very understandable. You know, this queen looks incredibly dangerous, so black decided, right, want to exchange queens. And Bronstein obliged. And here, actually, if he simply plays knight takes c7, just grabbing material back, obviously one of those rooks is going to go, in fact, it's a pretty clear advantage for white, just in terms of material, um, but also a huge lead in development. Black's queenside pieces are really poor. White's pieces are wonderful. But I suspect that Bronstein simply didn't really consider that and instead was just playing for the attack. And bishop d3, why not? The rook now looks at the knight. And here, in fact, knight f2 is the best move, just to get that knight out. But then knight takes c7. And, well, it, it's incredibly messy. Um, once again, my computer, I'm relying on computer lines here. I won't go into huge detail, but it thinks that this is the best continuation with this idea in mind and I'm showing you this because it's absolutely remarkable now at the moment white is a piece down but white's pieces are so active and because the knight on e8 is protected in fact it's very difficult for black to bring that rook into the game and White stands better. Well, that stands better. That's that's maybe an exaggeration, but White certainly has excellent compensation for the piece. Anyway, it's, it's just a crazy position. But instead, 
of knight f2, certainly the best move. Black lost his nerve, played knight a6 to defend that pawn. But the knight is actually just very badly placed on a6. Rook takes knight. So at the moment, white is the exchange down, but has tremendous compensation because it's very hard to quell the initiative now. The best move is to play d6. Now here's a cool move, c3, which protects the d4 pawn, but also makes absolutely sure that this knight isn't coming into the game because those pawns are just too strong. And here, well, white's still the exchange down, but this pawn is going to drop. And because the knight is so poorly placed, actually, once again, white has tremendous compensation there and actually definitely has the better chances. Let's come back here. So white has just taken the knight. And here, actually, black collapsed. C6, which allows this knight into d6 wow what a square i mean that really paralyzes black's pieces at least on the queen side anyway the knight threatens the rook rook e6 and now simply knight e3 well the knight just dominates bishop h6 well that can be taken now here black took the knight if rook takes, then simply knight takes, and, and white maintains that dominating knight. Rook takes knight. Bishop c4 check. The king had to go in the corner. Knight takes f5. Well, now <laughs> there's a threat to play bishop g7 check. And, well, if, if rook g6, there are, I'm sure there are many, many ways to win. But you've got to watch out for that rook about to enter the game on e8 that will probably finish things off among other things so rook takes bishop knight takes d5 and here black resigned in fact black has managed to survive into an end game let's just see exactly why he resigned well after pawn takes bishop first of all white is a pawn up just one little problem that this king threatens to trap the knight so let's just spin the knight back into the middle on this dominating e5 square. And now, well, a second pawn is probably going to drop. And, well, not only does white have extra material here, but the knight is absolutely dominating and black's bishop is not very clever. So it's a, it really is a completely winning endgame for white. So that was the final position. Just to repeat, Bronstein was 70 years old when he played that game. Incredible energy. Um, it was featured in this book, actually. Um, it was included in one of the chapters in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. That's by Bronstein and Feustenberg. And uh, it's actually, by coincidence, it's included in the chapter uh, 70 picturesque games and yeah he was 70 years old and and his comment Bronstein's comment on this game was white's most active pieces the knights black's most passive pieces the whole queen side and that's absolutely right isn't it these pieces actually never got in the game beautiful well there'll be more games coming from Bronstein very soon. And once again, thank you very much for all your suggestions.